Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the American Enterprise Institute. Um, I'm Yuval Levin. I'm Director of Social, Cultural, and Constitutional Studies here at AI, and it's really a great pleasure for me to, to welcome you to a discussion of a very important new book by Ryan Patrick Hanley, Our Great Purpose, Adam Smith, on um, Living a Better Life. Um, Ryan Hanley is a professor of political science at Boston College, a much admired teacher and scholar, and a foremost authority on the work and thought of Adam Smith. He's the author, among other books, of Adam Smith and the Character of Virtue. He's the editor of the Penguin Classics edition of the Theory of Moral Sentiments. Ryan has a PhD from the Committee on Social Thought at the University of Chicago. And maybe I can reveal that we were graduate students there together uh, a million and a half years ago, at the turn of the century, I think is what we say now, um, studying with wonderful teachers uh, like Ralph Lerner and Leon Cass. I think we knew that we were lucky, Ryan, but we probably didn't know how lucky we were. Um, and it was certainly obvious to all of us then that Ryan uh, would go on to be one of the great scholars of political philosophy of our generation, and I think that's just what has happened. Uh, this is a particularly opportune time to take up Adam Smith and to do it at a place like AI. We think of Adam Smith as one of the fathers of capitalism, and he certainly is that. And our politics now is engaged in something of a debate about capitalism, though it's not exactly a debate about economics. We know that the market makes our society wealthier. The question is whether that comes at a cost, at a moral cost, that we need to consider and to address, whether life in a commercial society can also be a life directed to some ideal of the good uh, and how that might be done. And that, in fact, is exactly the question that occupied Adam Smith, even if it's not always the question that we naturally associate with him. And it's the question that occupies this book, and so it's the question that will occupy us this morning. So our format will be very straightforward. Uh, Ryan will be up here talking about the book for a little bit. The two of us will chat a little about it afterward, and then we'll open it up to Q&A with all of you. So with that, please help me welcome Ryan Patrick Hanley. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Yuval, for that very kind, too kind, I'm sure, uh, introduction. And thanks very much to AEI for hosting this, uh, this wonderful event. And indeed, thanks to you for coming out on this uh, 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 Friday, Friday morning here. Um, I want to begin, actually, precisely where uh, you've all began, which is our, our discussion is, of course, to talk about Adam Smith today. But I wanted to start with a few words about um, uh, capitalism today, because to say only the very least, we live in very strange times when it comes to talking about capitalism. On the left, of course, we're seeing an unprecedented enthusiasm, certainly unprecedented in my lifetime, even if we do go back to the last century, as you've all reminds us an unprecedented enthusiasm for quote unquote democratic socialism. On the right, of course, we're seeing equally unprecedented in my time, enthusiasm for such things as protectionism, trade tariffs, uh, among other things. On both sides, we're also seeing this unprecedented agreement on the grave dangers that inequality poses to social stability. So across the political spectrum, for all its many divisions, we're seeing a widespread consensus, I think, that capitalism simply isn't working. So whichever party claims victory in 2020, I strongly suspect that capitalism as we know it, as I've come to know it, coming of age in the 80s, post-Cold War environment, this capitalism is going to change. And I wanted to begin here because I think it's incumbent upon us to think very hard about what's going to come next. And frankly, I find great reasons to be concerned, concerned that there is a grave possibility that we may not continue to progress, but in fact to regress. But it's precisely in the spirit of wanting to begin to try to chart a path forward that I think it's incumbent upon us to turn back to Adam Smith. For whatever capitalism has become today, it seems to me that Smith's vision now more than ever demands recovery. And I think this for two very specific reasons that I wanted to begin with at the outset. First among the reasons of why Smith's vision is worth recovering, worth making the effort to recover today, concerns his own defense of free markets and specifically the defense that he launched from his perspective as a professor of moral philosophy, which was, of course, his employment at the University of Glasgow well before he began to write on economic questions. 
Smith, the moral philosopher, thought that the free society based upon free markets was ultimately good for one very specific reason, namely, specifically, its capacity to generate what he called the quote unquote universal opulence that specifically benefits the least well off in society. Thus, point blank, what justified the market society in the vision of capitalism's founding father, the professor of moral philosophy, Adam Smith, was precisely its capacity to alleviate poverty. And I think this is something worth remembering in an age in which the dominant discussion around capitalism, especially in the popular, uh, popular discussions, has shifted focus away from poverty onto questions specifically of inequality. And I think that there's something advantageous in turning to Smith to remind us of how we need to conceptually disaggregate these two very distinct questions that demand two very distinct responses, poverty and inequality. It seems to me that there's also something deeply attractive, potentially, about Adam Smith's vision, insofar as it cuts across an ideological spectrum that's very familiar to us today. Smith, that is, uses the mechanisms that we continually associate with the political right, markets, and he believes that these are primi primarily beneficial insofar as they can help us achieve the ends that have been classically associated with the political left, that is, the lifting up the, uh, and the bettering of the condition of the least well-off in our society. And so it seems to me that Smith's commitment to recover, or, or, or I should say Smith's commitment to using markets to benefit the least well-off, is perhaps the first and most important reason why it's important to try to recover his vision today. But there's also a second reason that motivates my turn to Smith and I think also might uh, make it worthwhile for us more generally to make an effort to recover Smith. And it's the second reason that's really at the heart of the present book uh, that I've just most recently written and that we're here to discuss today. And this concerns the type of life that citizens in a commercial society often find themselves living. There's a common worry today, and again, a worry that I think spans across the political spectrum. And that is that capitalism encourages certain kinds of lifestyles, and that these lifestyles may in fact be detrimental. Detrimental to the well-being both of those who live them and also to those who live in a society surrounded by people pursuing wealth and opulence and greatness. But here, I think Smith may have the most to teach us. And to see this, in the book, I focus not on Smith's economic philosophy, primarily, as presented in The Wealth of Nations, the book for which he continues to be famous today, but in fact, his moral philosophy, as primarily presented in his uh, other book, The Theory of Moral Sentiments, the book that he drew from his lectures to his undergraduates on moral philosophy. Because I think it's in this book that we see not only Smith, the professor of moral philosophy, the ethicist, but we also see him working out a very particular type of moral philosophy. It's there, I think, that we see him develop what I call in the book, drawing upon a tradition, a philosophy of living. Now, I know that that seems something of a strange phrase, perhaps even a bit of an archaic phrase today, the philosophy of living. But I want to emphasize this because I think this is where, or at least where I try, to add something to the already voluminous discussions of Adam Smith, which are extant in the literature. Because the fact that Smith was a moral philosopher is very well known now to scholars, even if it's, uh, the news is still getting out among the general public. But what I want to do is uh, not simply reiterate that Smith was an academic moral philosopher, but again, a moral philosopher of a very specific type. One who is interested precisely in this idea of the philosophy of living. So what does it mean to have a philosophy of living? What did Smith think he meant by this? Smith himself ends the theory of moral sentiments by asking, what are the sorts of questions that any good moral philosophy should answer? And he says, first and foremost, the most important question in a system of moral philosophy is point blank the question, quote unquote, wherein does virtue consist? Or, as he goes on to say, what, quote, constitutes the excellent or praiseworthy character? 
Now, to say the very least, this is a very different approach to moral philosophy than that which most academic moral philosophy, either in Smith's day or in ours, what tends to be dominant. Instead, Smith is very consciously, in answering his question about what moral philosophy should do, he's very consciously hearkening back to an older tradition, and specifically a classical tradition, a tradition that goes back to Plato and Aristotle, to the Stoics, to thinkers who are interested in ethics less to define what is right and what is wrong, and more to define the questions that have to do with the nature of happiness, the questions of virtue, the questions of what it means to have, as Smith says, an excellent character. And I think the right way to read Smith is indeed to see how he sought to recover this approach to ethics. Now, put that way, even if one is with me and agrees that Smith is interested in these questions of virtue, the way I've just set it up sets up a very obvious question. If Smith is indeed doing the sort of thing that Plato did, that Aristotle did, that Cicero did, that the other Stoics did, why not just read them? After all, we have them easily available and they're frequently taught at today's universities. But here's where I think things get really interesting because even as Smith is working in their tradition, He's going beyond the ancients in a very conscious way. Those ancient philosophers, that is, wrote specifically for the context of the ancient world. They wrote for the ancient polis, which is, to say the very least, not our world. We live in a modern world, a secular world, a global world, a commercial world, and Adam Smith, as the foremost uh, founding father of capitalism, understood this world as well as any. And he understood both its profound benefits as well as the profound and unique challenges that it poses. So one of the, shall we say, Smith's comparative advantages when we come to comparing him with thinkers like Aristotle, Plato, the Stoics, is that Smith wrote for our world, understanding our world from within. And the theory of virtue that he seeks to develop, the theory of the praiseworthy and excellent character, is one that is very consciously meant to navigate the unique challenges that come with living in a commercial society with all its wonderful freedoms and also with all of its very specific challenges. So what then are the challenges of Smith's world, our world, and how does his philosophy of living help us navigate them? I alluded to just one of them uh, briefly before, and I want to emphasize it here because it's one that's especially central to Smith's project. Our world today, and I give away no secrets when I say this, rewards the pursuit above all, wealth, status, and the power that comes with these. These are the things that Smith himself said are worshipped, are esteemed, are chased by many. These are, the desire of getting these particular goods, are what drive our efforts to get ahead. And anybody that lectures, as I do, to rooms of 18 to 22-year-old students, they're always ready to nod in agreement with this. This seems very familiar to them as they are at uh, their elite universities, working hard, striving always to move upward and onward on the ladder. Smith thinks, by and large, this is a good thing. The fact that people desire these goods and that we live in a society that gives us an opportunity to pursue these goods, Smith recognizes that there are genuine benefits to this, and in fact, benefits that redound to all of us. Smith calls this process of chasing wealth, status, and power, both in the theory of moral sentiments and the wealth of nations, he calls this the desire to, quote unquote, better our condition. And this is the engine of commercial progress and indeed economic growth. Were it not for this, if individuals were simply content with what they have, never concerned to push forward, growth would cease and we would all be worse off for it. So there's a definite material benefit that Smith understood as well as any to this desire to better our condition. At the same time, even as Smith appreciated the profound material benefits, the universal opulence that this process in aggregate brings, he also recognizes the profound moral challenges that this poses to the individuals engaged in these pursuits. To say only the least uh, on this front, bettering our condition, as good as it may be for the society around us and for all of us in the aggregate, 
is often very dangerous for us individually. And my undergraduates, again, know this as they come into my 9 a.m. seminars bleary-eyed after having stayed up all night working hard, hopefully doing my reading and not just preparing for the other tests that they have. But as they recognize instantly in the figures that Smith describes, and he describes one figure very memorably. He gives us the parable of a young man. He calls him the, quote, poor man's son, whom heaven in its anger has visited with ambition. A young man knows that he comes from little, but wants to be great, wants to be esteemed, wants to be recognized. What does he do? He slaves all his life. He's obsequious to his superiors. He works hard to generate talents so that he can be seen out in the world. What happens? It turns out not to be a happy story, Smith thinks. We today talk of the rat race. In the mid, 20th, or mid uh, 18th century, Smith understood this as well as anybody. He tells us that this young man, sweating, scurrying, running around always trying to chase esteem, never gets what it is he most wants, which is the tranquility and satisfaction that comes from being able to relax and say, aha, I've made it. The poor man's son goes to his deathbed, quite literally, never having achieved what it is that he was after in the first place. Even further, the poor man's son not only fails to achieve the happiness that he set out for from the very beginning, but he also, in his interactions with others, there's some less than pleasant aspects that come out. The possibilities of becoming competitive with others, duplicitous with others, what we often call inauthentic with others, showing one side of ourselves while being something else in an effort to appear attractive so that we might move ahead ever further. Again, my students always at this moment in the semester say, this sounds a lot like social media. And they're all very familiar with the process of curating themselves to put their best image forward so that they can be seen in a certain way to get exactly the likes which are our 21st century proxy for exactly this esteem and approbation that Smith discusses. We're left then with the poor man's son and with the problem that he represents more generally, with this deep paradox that Smith himself understood as well as any and lies at the heart of the book that I've um, uh, just written and tried to uh, develop. And that is very specifically, the desire to better our condition brings material opulence, but it also brings the potential for grave moral dangers and especially what Smith himself calls moral, quote unquote, corruption. What then to do? In the face of that, what options are available? At least two options are very familiar from our contemporary political standpoint. On the one hand, perhaps it's the case that we simply have to pay our dues. If we want all these great benefits, we have to accept that with these upsides come some downsides. The engine of economic growth is so profound, perhaps a bit of moral corruption is simply the price we have to pay. This sort of rhetoric is not unfamiliar from a certain side of free market fundamentalism that has been prominent in the past. On the other side, taking seriously the dilemma that yes, there might be opulence, but also these grave dangers of moral corruption, another side on the other side of the spectrum gives an alternative answer. Perhaps the, if it's so bad, what do we need to do? We need to change it altogether. And the costs are so high of these market processes that perhaps repeal and replace, to use a phrase, is necessary. This option, of course, doesn't come from the, uh, 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 from the uh, free market fundamentalists, but of course is the option on the table, increasingly being put on the table by democratic socialism. What I think makes Smith so valuable is the way in which, in taking this problem seriously, he tries to present an alternative to both of the options that are familiar to us and on the table today. That is, believing that commercial society, indeed, on the basis of the profound goods that it generates, is worth saving. Believing that these good things are, in fact, good things, but believing that the bad things that come with them are, in fact, bad things, Smith's question is different from either those of the free market fundamentalists on the one side or the democratic socialists on the other. His question becomes, what specifically can we do to maximize the benefits and minimize the harms so that we can preserve the genuine dream that this has extended to us in market society, the hope of decent, dignified, flourishing lives 
in an order that creates, quote unquote, universal opulence. What then can we do? And what is Smith's third way? It's this that I really, uh, again, lies at the heart of the book, and I hope we'll discuss in greater depth in our uh, discussion and Q&A. But let me end by saying that Smith takes various routes to this. If our hope is to maximize the benefits and minimize the harms, there are a multi-pronged approach that Smith lays out. Among other things, there is a very specific role for government. At the end of The Wealth of Nations, having described what he calls the mental mutilation that comes from repetitive, specialized labor that we know from, say, factory work today, Smith tells us that, quote unquote, some attention of government is necessary in order to offset these dangers. And he believes that they, in fact, pose a domestic national security risk. It's not simply out of humane beneficence, but in fact, out of a concern for the democratic stability and democratic processes. But again, that's one of Smith's prongs. And it's a dangerous prong, and it's worth talking through, because saying that some attention of government is necessary is very different from saying that government has all the answers. So there's quite a bit worth parsing there and discussing. But my book, this book, wants to look at Smith's other prong. And that is, if we hope to extend the possibility of leading decent and dignified lives in a challenging world, a world that specifically has the challenges that come with this commercial society, Smith thinks that it's not simply a question of government's attention, but in fact the development of what he himself calls character. Character that comes from the appreciation of, specifically, virtue and indeed certain discrete virtues. Among the ones that Smith is especially interested in, prudence, beneficence, self-command, and justice. This becomes his pantheon of the four virtues that are most necessary in a commercial society. And we can talk about more about those individually and discreetly, but suffice it to say, just to bring these remarks to a conclusion, that what binds all of these together is the way in which, common to all of them, is the way in which they are able to help us achieve in a world that seems anxious to subvert it, the balance that Smith thinks is necessary for living happy, tranquil, flourishing lives. As I mentioned already, and which Smith was very sensitive to, we live in a world that pulls us in all sorts of directions all at once. And you only have to spend a little bit of time with faculty members to hear lots of concerns about work-life balance, which seems to be the phrase on many people's lips, especially those of my junior colleagues on the tenure track. These are real challenges, and in a world in which we have to earn our living and continue to climb the ladder, carving out a space of balance is challenging. Smith is concerned for us to adopt certain virtues that will help us be able to establish this balance, both in terms of our desires to better our condition professionally, but also the duties we have to those around us, to those we love, to those in our communities and our neighborhoods. But this balance even goes further. And Smith believes not only are we torn between work and home, profession and personal life, the rift goes even further. And as you go further down, you see that this theme of balance reemerges in several places in Smith. Among other things, it reemerges in his conception of human nature. In the very first sentence of the book, Smith tells us, the theory of moral sentiments begins by saying, quote, how selfish soever man may be supposed, there are evidently some principles in his nature that interest him in the fortunes of others. The point of departure of Smith's entirely, entire moral philosophy is precisely the idea that we are natured, we are built, we are hardwired, both to be self-interested, but also to be interested in the happiness of others. In fact, the claim that he makes is so strong that the happiness of others is necessary to us. It's not that we have a disinterested or altruistic concern that others do okay. It is deep into our self-interest to also be interested in the well-being and the happiness of others. Again and again, Smith comes back to these sorts of concerns. What sort of single life can we lead, given that we in fact all have only one life to lead, that will do justice to these competing concerns, our desires for our own self-interest to be realized, our desires for others to be happy, our desires to pursue wealth and greatness out in the world, 
and the duties that we owe to those around us in our homes, our families, our communities. Trying to navigate this particular tension is at the heart of Smith's understanding of the world that we live in and its challenges, but also the remedy that he seeks to provide as a theorist of the excellent and praiseworthy character. The character that he himself embodies with a wonderful portrait of a particular figure, perhaps the antidote to that poor man's son, the one that he calls the, quote, wise and virtuous man who becomes the pinnacle figure who is able to resolve all of this. But perhaps we can talk about that more in discussion. I'll leave that. Uh, but I wanted to open up with these opening remarks to set the scene for what I think is um, not just a question of academic interest. I've written all those books already with all the footnotes that have to come with those and wading through all the literature. It seems to me that Smith speaks to a real issue that is important to us both as real individuals living in real time in our world and given the unique um, uh, opportunities and challenges that our, uh, our, our, our own unique world poses. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Ryan. A, a, a wonderful overview of uh, what is really an extraordinary book. It's, it's an unusual kind of book. Um, when you first look at it, it seems like it's a, it's a, a set of selections from Smith. Mm -hmm. uh, each chapter begins with a quote. But when you get through it and, and step back, it, it makes one whole argument, a, a kind of coherent case that sets out what you present as Smith's goal in his moral philosophy, some challenges that he confronts, and some solutions that he offers to those challenges. I wonder if we can dig into the book a little by thinking about each of those. Because the goal itself, as you lay it out, is, is, is an interesting concept. Um, the idea that the purpose is to live a life well, to have an idea of what it is to live a life, and in a sense to live looking at yourself as if from the outside mm. and judging your life constantly. How does that work? What kind of a moral philosophy is that? And what, how does it play out for Smith, this notion of living a life, a good life? Yeah, I, I really like very much the last locution you use, of sort of looking at, at yourself, because this is an idea that's really authentic to Smith and central to Smith. Smith has a, uh, he, he describes a figure in the course of the uh, theory of moral sentiments uh, called the impartial spectator. And what he tells us is that all of us, as we go through our lives, as we feel our certain feelings, as we act in the world, we're aware simultaneously as we act that other people are watching us, judging us. And often we try to conform to the ways in which we're being watched and judged. Sometimes that can be beneficial. That can raise us up, that can lead us to bring out the best in us. But of course, if you're around the wrong people and it's the wrong spectators that are judging us and you're simply trying to please them, this can be deeply pernicious and even corrupting. So Smith tells us that we have to generate this capacity, and he uses this figure of the impartial spectator, to be able to step back, to take into account the judgments of others, but to be able to step back from ourselves, to look at ourselves as objectively as we can, to judge ourselves in terms of have we achieved that level of excellence that we might wish? In simply trying to uh, chase the esteem of others, are we in fact simply becoming the cipher of their uh, interests rather than having had a bit of a reflection upon what might be beneficial, what might be dangerous in our particular actions. So I really like the idea of this um, um, becoming a spectator of the self is one of the things that Smith often describes and he says we have to sometimes divide ourselves in two is the wonderful locution he uses. To look down on ourselves, to try and see ourselves objectively and indeed in the impartial light of reason. At the heart of that is the idea that we're always being watched, right? Mm -hmm. And it's something that stands out in the theory of moral sentiments. You suggested that uh, your students recognize something of the world of social media uh -huh. when, they, when they work through the book a little bit. But there really is a sense for Smith that it, it, is, it is worthwhile to live with the understanding that we're being watched. And in fact, that there's a, there's a kind of moral value in that up to a point, mm. uh, right? But, the, the, the notion that what we desire is that being watched, that we are after attention, and that attention is enormously attractive and valuable, is an amazingly contemporary concept that you find in, in, Smith moral, in Smith's moral philosophy. What is this idea of attention that everybody seems to seek? It's, it's almost more important to him, or, or he says it's more important to us than just about anything else in our lives. Yeah, it's really, 
the modern word of attention is particularly unique, right? Because we live in an age in which um, uh, everyone wants the attention of others. But what's the most common lament of our particular age? Attention spans are themselves contracting, which only sort of raises up the particular worry that Smith had, this great irony that we're all seeking to be seen by others while all those others are always being wish to be recognized themselves. So there is this sort of, um, not a virtuous circle, but a very vicious circle that could emerge from this pursuit of attention. But Smith wants to emphasize, again, that it's not all bad. That there are, if we structure our communities in certain ways, if we have certain types of norms, that desire for attention, or what he often calls esteem, or even praise, can be a healthy thing. Provided, too, that it's always balanced out with a question of, the capacity to recognize what's really deserving. So he likes this mm. language, not just of attention and praise, but also the language of praiseworthiness. And he really believes that we are wired, to use the modern locution, not just to um, uh, want the praises, to want the attention, but indeed to be worthy of these. And at the end of the day, after all the praises have come, we still want to be able to sit with ourselves, to be able to give an account to ourselves of, um, did I earn it? Did I deserve it? And he thinks that if we've lost that entirely, something deeply unnatural has emerged, and that really is a deep stage of corruption that worries him greatly, when it only becomes about the attention and the praise, and the praiseworthiness has faded out altogether. Mm. Use the word corruption, and, and, and Smith does too. The, 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 the danger that he forces us to confront when, it, when we think about the commercial society or modern life mm. has to do with some corruption of our moral sentiments, he mm -hmm. says. What's the nature of that corruption? What really is the danger? Yeah, he uses that word in a very direct place where he tells us that uh, in a chapter heading, he, he added to one of the later editions and revisions of the book that he made. He tells us that this disposition to worship the rich and the great and to, quote unquote, despise the poor and mean is at once what builds social rank and hierarchy and stability in society, but also is what corrupts our moral sentiments. And Smith is very direct there. It's one of the moments in the book that I think is most remarkable because, as I like to tell my students, I think Smith is tremendously honest. He's one of the most honest thinkers I know. He's never a Pollyanna that only gives one side of the story. He never believes, chicken little, that the sky is falling. There's always this balanced understanding. And even with this idea of corruption, he understands that the worship of the rich can be beneficial, but insofar as it specifically leads to the neglect and to the despising of the poor, there's a real danger. And that's where he introduces, perhaps most directly, the idea of corruption. So in one way, it certainly has to do with this neglect of the poor. And the other place where it comes out really directly is his comments upon the effects on the, uh, what he calls the laboring poor in a commercial society. I, I made brief allusion to the mental mutilation that he describes. But it even goes further. I mean, if that's not enough of a dramatic uh, image for you, he tells us that um, this act of divided specialized labor, which is, of course, the engine of progress, is also what leads to not simply corruption, but the abandonment of every, quote, intellectual, social, and martial virtue. This really is the abandonment of all, as Smith says, the, quote, noblest faculties that human beings are capable of. So this corruption goes all the way down, and it comes precisely from these dispositions and processes that he himself has praised and has analyzed for their benefits. So what can you do about it? If these problems are, are real and deep, and certainly in, in our own living with, with a market society, we encounter them. We find critics who raise them, but even defenders of the market economy can't help but note them and, and acknowledge them. What, what can we actually do about it? If the problem is such a deep problem of potential moral corruption, it's also a social problem, uh, as Smith describes it. What, what do the solutions look like? Well, uh, you're right, and, and um, Smith himself is the, the figure perhaps most uh, classically associated with the idea of take it slow when it comes to big problems, mm -hmm. right? Uh, Smith is always playing the long game, as it were, and is deeply suspicious of any thinkers who would come out and say, I've got a plan, come follow me, let's do it now. 
And so that's certainly true when it comes to economic issues, but I think it's also true for these yeah. grave moral issues that really do go all the way down. He would never institute any sort of sweeping and dramatic plan. Um, I'm enjoying as my bedtime reading a wonderful book that was written at mid-century uh, by a Yale historian about the terror. It's called mm -hmm. 12 Who Ruled, uh, a portrait of uh, the 12 figures who were leaders of the Committee on Public Safety in, in 1793. These were men with a plan, and these were men that had virtue on the mind and on their lips. And it led where? To, among other things, the guillotine. I mean, there are real dangers that come from trying to institute virtue by plan. but bringing questions of uh, awareness, raising people's sensitivity, talking to them in such a way as I believe Smith tried to do with his own students, telling them about the dangers, making them feel some of the challenges of the poor man's son. To become self-reflective, I think, is what Smith tried to induce. Not plans of virtue to be instituted on society, not educational programs to be instituted through K through 12 uh, comprehensively, but rather this understanding of trying to induce an awareness on the level of the individual to begin to ask themselves, not what can we do about it as a society, how can we legislate it, but what can I do to be able to navigate these particular challenges in light of a greater awareness of how they're operating in our lives. Mm. So if the question is what can I do, mm -hmm. Smith is offering more than a contemplative life as a solution to the challenges mm. of of, uh, of, of, of the modern market society, right? It's not, the answer is not to, to be de the detached philosopher. There's a lot of action in Smith. In fact, he describes the human person as, as made for action. Yeah. Um, what kind of action is good for us rather than bad for us? Yeah, no, this is, it's a wonderful way to put it. And I think it brings us back to that figure that he describes, the wise and virtuous man that I alluded to at the end. Um, That's not Socrates, right? That's not the, 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 the philosopher. Indeed. I mean, and when we think about these other people that discuss the best lives available to human beings, Plato and, and Aristotle among others, there are familiar options that any reader of classical philosophy would know. One is the life of the engaged gentleman in politics, living in the city as a good citizen engaged in practical affairs. Another alternative the life of the philosopher, who lives a life that's withdrawn, but dedicated to the pursuit of the good, the true, and the beautiful. These are, to differing degrees, worthy lives, but candidates for the highest excellence. Smith does something a little bit different. And um, uh, it's neither simply the life of action nor the life of contemplation. But I think he meant something very specific in choosing the language of the wise and virtuous man. That suggests at some level, the combination of each of these. And Smith himself believes that the best life is never one that is withdrawn. He's very critical, in fact, of the withdrawn, what we would think of as the ivory tower philosopher. But he also thinks that there's something very dangerous of only acting in the world and never stepping back and reflecting. So he describes this wise and virtuous man as simultaneously working very hard to come up with an idea of excellence, of perfection, something that requires contemplation and reflection, but then using that, thinking about where they stand in, in terms of perfection, and then going out into the world and acting in a particular way in light of that. So there's this constant, what a philosopher might call dialectic, a movement between acting and stepping back and reflecting, and then using those reflections to go back into the world. To only be in one world or the other, Smith thinks, is ultimately limiting, and that uh, by moving back in between with the benefits that can be gathered from each, Smith says that that's what gives us the opportunity to live as well and healthily as possible. Mm. So is this a, a moral philosophy for individual judgment and action? Or does it point to some social institutions? Does it, you suggested before that one of the ways he thinks about addressing some of the problems created by the division of labor has to do with public education, other roles for government. How does he think about, about society acting on these problems? Education is a very important part of the project as a whole. Uh, he's very direct in the, theory, er, in the wealth of nations uh, in telling us the government has three duties. There are three duties of the state. Justice, make sure the property rights are, are protected. Uh, defense, a military that's able to defend the borders and public goods, public works, 
And under this are the familiar things you would expect from a theorist of commercial society, roads, canals, bridges, get products to market. But also under that same rubric are a comprehensive school systems of education at taxpayer expense. And that's really very interesting because not only does it subvert some familiar stereotypes of Smith as a small government guy, but it also suggests the importance that Smith put on the understanding that we need to have a certain foundation, that uh, without certain basic skills, that it will be impossible to develop any of these higher faculties that are required for living that fully flourishing life. The, the way that you describe this desire for balance, this seeking of, uh, of, of both wisdom and virtue, I think naturally raises the question of whether Smith saw some role for religion in this. Mm. And your book takes up the question of Smith on religion in an interesting way. Um, I take you to reject the almost consensus view that Smith is uh, a, a, a not a, if not an atheist, a non-Christian. Um, was he? Wasn't he? How yeah. did he think about, about God? How did he think about Christianity? This is the conversation that inevitably we have as Smith scholars when we get together at the pub <laughs> and starts getting late. Uh, um, here's Smith was an incredibly guarded man. And he plays, especially with questions of religion, things very close to the vest. I think that there are good reasons to believe that he is not, in fact, um, perhaps as close to his friend, the great infidel David Hume, as some have suggested. I think it would be fair to say is the consensus opinion. However, it's also true that Smith had certain reservations when it came especially to the dominant form of revealed religion, uh, common in his day. Um, and he is a critic of certain forms of what he calls, like many Enlightenment philosophers, enthusiasm and zealotry. Where I think Smith really adds to the discussion about religion and what makes him so interesting as a moral philosopher thinking about religion is that he uses a very unique phrase that, so far as I'm aware, isn't used by other 18th century philosophers, is that he describes what he calls in the human mind the natural sentiments of religion. And he seems to believe that, on the one hand, religion is natural to us. Now, we'd have to parse and try and figure out what he means when he calls these the natural sentiments of religion. But at least the desire or longing to believe, and to believe very specifically in a creator, and Smith tells us a creator who will reward justice in the afterlife and punish the unjust in an afterlife. Smith thinks that there is something, and this is simply the surface of the text. I'm not saying anything controversial in that. Uh, Smith believes that this is part of how we're made. Now, what to do with that? Many different questions, and it can go in a lot of directions. But I think that is really a unique element of Smith's moral philosophy that adds a certain richness to the discussions that sometimes the debates over you know, belief and atheism and how we ought to uh, have religion in the public square, that this is a side of um, uh, the discussion of religion that needs to happen with the question of how natural is it to us? Is it perhaps natural for us to believe? Smith thinks yes. Uh -huh. When he talks about Christianity, he talks about it often in terms of a religion of love. And in fact, there's an odd, there, there's an odd profusion of love in the theory of moral sentiments. What does he mean by it? Because it's not, I think, what I mean by it, or what, uh -huh. uh, or, or what students who we work through this with mean by it. The idea that we ought to live in such a way as to be both loved and deserving of love seems mm. central to how he wants people to orient their moral life. How do you understand that idea? Yeah, it, it's good. I had this sort of strange, I, I'll use the word revelation, but I'll use that very colloquially. Uh, in, in trying to figure out Smith on religion, everybody's interested in, was he a Christian or not? I, I did the, uh, what seemed to me the, 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 a not terribly inventive thing to do, but to try to look to see what he said about Christianity. And he only mentions Christianity all of three places in the theory of moral sentiments. And each time, it's very focally, his reference is to the Christian concept of love. For him, Christianity is fundamentally a religion of love. And that fact helps, I think, color the way in which he's describing love elsewhere in the theory of moral sentiments. There are many ways that our tradition, of course, has a vocabulary to be able to discuss love. 
And when one thinks about love, love encompasses a remarkable number of different passions. Even just to go back to the classical foundations, we know from Plato and Aristotle, eros, erotic love, what then transformed into romantic love, one type of love. The love that's associated with friends, friendship, is another kind of distinct love, especially in the Aristotelian tradition. But also, and especially becoming prominent with the Christian tradition, the love that's associated with the idea of caritas, the love of neighbor. And I think that's the side of love that Smith is invested in. And he gets us there not through Christian foundations. There's no um, injunction in Smith, love the Lord God above all things and then love thy neighbor as thyself. There's a lot of love thyself, self-love is concept, and there's a lot of love thy neighbor. So I think one of the things that Smith is doing, since he doesn't spend a lot of time with the injunction to love God, mm. is to try and ask how in a secularized world in which the injunction to love God might not be avail available to everybody in the same way, how is it that we can save what was good, what was noble, what was healthy about Christian ideas, and not just Christian ideas, but religious ideas more generally, of neighbor love in a world that is fundamentally deeply down secular? Given all of that, what, what really is the insight of the wise and virtuous man? What is this model that we should be trying to, to copy or that stands as a solution to the problem that confronts us in, in trying to live a good life in modern times? What has that person understood or done that we can learn from? I feel like this is a trick question because that would presume <laughs> that, uh, uh, that sitting somewhere on the stage is a wise and virtuous man. Uh, we should go find him and ask him. But from what I gather from reading Smith is, um, I mean, what makes the wise and virtuous man so remarkable is um, he spends his days, and Smith really describes how much work goes into this, trying to understand what true and absolute perfection would be. That is, not just, is he better than others around him? How good do most people get? He's asking not this sort of comparative question, but in terms of absolutes, what truly is the ideal that people should be shooting for? And as he crafts that ideal, it's not simply just to gaze upon that ideal and think of its beauty, but he thinks about himself relative to this ideal. And this is where I think Smith, perhaps it's Christian, he certainly uses Christian language here, but I don't think one needs to understand it as Christian. But the effect of thinking about the ideal is very specific upon him. It is, as Smith says, humbling. To think that there is an absolute excellence, perhaps even for such an individual who's seen this excellence, when they reflect upon themselves, there is inevitably the recognition how far short they fall of it. So the wise and virtuous man's a very unique figure. Having seen what true excellence is, it's not, oh, 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 look at me, I know the truth. It is, look how far I am from it. And that reflection then changes the life that he leads. Recognizing his own humility, Smith tells us, and he uses this phrase too three times in the book, that such a person, once they've thought about ideal perfection and how far they fall short of it, recognizes that they are, quote, just one of the multitude, no better than any other in it. The very best person, and Smith doesn't hesitate to use that language, the very best person is marked by his or her realization that they are no better than any other. Now that subverts a lot of ancient understandings of human greatness, uh, but I think it also presents a very interesting new way and a new challenge for those of us who live in a society that rewards self-interest, egocentrism and these sorts of things, to begin to try and struggle with the idea of um, what does it mean to believe that one is fundamentally no better than any others and that all others are equally as good as them. The person who's able to define that has done something very rare and very special for Smith, but he thinks that that's the ideal, the beneficial ideal for us to strive to. So a path to equality from the bottom and not from the top. Not I think from. it's not wrong to say that Smith is a profound egalitarian. Mm -hmm. Yes, but it's a unique route to egalitarianism. Yeah. Well, I do want to open things up for questions, but <laughs> let me end with this. What, what should we walk away with from all of that? This is yeah. a book not for scholars, right? You've done that. 
This is a book for people who are interested in trying to understand how to live a good life in modern times. And ultimately, it, 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 is, is it that Smith offers us a way to maintain some balance in a world that wants to take you off balance? Is there a path here? Is there a, um, is there, is there a, not a recipe, but a, a way of following that we might, uh, that we might track to, to live a good life? You dedicate the book to your daughter. What do you hope your daughter walks away with in reading this book? Aha. Um, well, first of all, <laughs> I, I hope she does read it. She's a busy 16-year-old with finals coming up and all these sorts of things. So uh, I'm giving her Christmas break to plow her way through it here. Um, but uh, no, I mean, first and foremost, I'll be very honest that what I hope readers of the book will take away is, um, I say this from the first page, I come back to it, I hope you'll go and read Smith. I think that uh, it's designed to be an introduction to go back to what has been, for me, an incredible uh, uh, font of wisdom and reflection. And if the test of a good book, a great book, is that we always learn something new from it, I've thumbed through the Theory of Moral Sentiments more than once. I keep finding, uh, 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 as I progress, it progresses with me and turns out to always be one step ahead of me. So I do hope that readers will go back because I think that there's a tremendous amount not just of personal meaning on the good life, but also, and we've only scratched the surface with this, but his reflections on the dynamic of human society, sociability, economics. Um, Smith is, um, he is vast and contains multitudes. So I hope yeah. that that's one thing that people will go back with. Um, and a second is, uh, you know, we've been using these words of virtue and corruption. And um, I think we're Smith today where he, he knows that our discourse has changed in many ways and that that language is not as familiar today. But what I hope people will, one of the things I hope people will take away is that um, these aren't simply antiquated concepts that have to do with an older area, pre-Victorian sort of thing. But um, in fact, for those of us that care about central questions of happiness, that they're the inescapable things that we have to think about and think through for ourselves individually to answer, to be able to live the lives that presumably every individual who wishes to be happy wishes to lead. So. Well, we haven't turned explicitly to economics, but we're at the American Enterprise Institute, so somebody's bound to do that. Okay. Um, let's open things up for questions. Uh, I would only ask that you tell us who you are and uh, actually ask a question. Start here. Hi, my name's Phil. I work here at the American Enterprise Institute as a research assistant, and I will turn back to the economics. Um, Smith deals with what economic historians call uh, Smithian growth, which is a division of labor causing micro-inventions and people to specialize and improve their tasks. But there's another type of growth. There's Schumpeterian growth, which is macro-invention technology change, which changes the inputs altogether, sometimes taking, eliminating whole categories of jobs. Um, Smith is actually very conscious about speed of change, and I was wondering if he has any uh, insights on speed of change and how it interacts with how that corrodes our reason and how that interacts with the, uh, topics of the theory of moral sentiments. Yeah, interestingly, one of the places where Smith's um, where sort of rate of change questions uh, emerge dramatically for Smith within the context of contemporary capitalism comes less from uh, a production standpoint, but from an investment standpoint. I think one of the things that worries Smith is the sort of risky speculation that tries in compressed time frames to, um, as we say, get rich quick. Uh, high risk, high return, high yield. That sort of speculation that's very familiar to us today, uh, uh, Smith thinks is, shall we say, dangerous and potentially destabilizing. So I used the locution earlier of playing the long game. I think Smith continually, when it comes to questions of um, investment in particular, is much more concerned uh, to encourage a society of sustained, long-term, perhaps slower rate growth in such a way that uh, would lend itself to, say, a shareholder capitalism vision. I, I was lucky enough to commission for a previous uh, collection of essays a wonderful essay by um, uh, Jack Bogle, the late Jack Bogle, who was the uh, founder and chairman of Vanguard Industries. Talk about a friend of uh, the small investor who's playing the long game uh, and is, in fact, as both Jack Bogle and Adam Smith 
both agreed was central to uh, both long-term growth um, or, or to long-term growth. So I think that that's one way in which we see this sort of long-term change, uh, 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 one of his, the focuses of his economics. You're, of course, uh, thinking specifically in, point, in terms of pointing it with the, the Schumpeterian uh, comparison. I, to, to which I, I'd only say one of the things that strikes me in Smith is that he's not a theorist, interestingly enough, of entrepreneurship. That isn't, he gives us a couple of very small examples of where this emerges. Early in the book, he talks about a young man who, um, because he wanted to spend more time with his play fellows, was able to improve upon the design of the fire engine so that it would run automatically and he could go and have more leisure time out on the playground. But those sorts of moments are relatively rare in Smith. So the idea of paradigm shifting, creative destruction, everything changing on a dime, um, Smith neither seems to think that those are the principal agents of change, nor necessarily the desirable agents of change. And so there is this sort of gradualism that I think goes deep down, all the way down in Smith. Do you think the character of industrialization would have surprised him? He wrote before that. We think of him as the father of capitalism, rightly, but he was writing at the end of the 18th century, and the real explosion of industrial manufacturing happens mm -hmm. 25 years later or so. Did he see it coming? Yeah, he certainly seems awfully prescient when he talks about, at the very least, the experience of working in that environment. Um, again, for him to describe the process of mental mutilation yeah. as early as 1776, at a time when, um, at the most, you would have household industries, not any sort of, sort of large-scale production, he does seem to be remarkably prescient in that respect. Whether he could have seen GM in Detroit down the road. I, I, I think that some of those things, um, it's difficult to make that sort of prediction. Yeah. Other questions? Please. Hi, I'm Chris Scalia. I work here at AEI, too, um, but I have no interest in economics, so I'm not going to ask you about that. Um, first, thank you very much for, for coming here and, and for writing this book. It's fascinating. Um, I guess I'll just start right with the question. Um, how do you pitch Smith's ideas to a culture that really challenges the, the concept of, of objectivity? Um, because mm -hmm. it seems like so much of what he's doing in the theory of moral sentiments relies on, well, the concept of the impartial observer mm -hmm. uh, assumes some level of objectivity and our ability to detach ourselves from our own emotions um, and to consider how other people might be feeling in order to engage with them sympathetically. Uh, and it seems like that very ability to put, put ourselves in each other's shoes, we, or another person's shoes, we elevate that to a large degree, but also um, I think the concept of identity politics, for example, um, also challenges that very, that very notion. So how do, you, how do you justify that way of thinking, that Smith's way of thinking there, and, and apply that um, to, to people today who might be more skeptical about it? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. And um, when I teach it, I teach it in the way that Smith presents it, because I think he may have been aware of at least an aspect of this question, which is you're right to say that objectivity is deeply important for Smith, and the figure of the impartial spectator is where a lot of this is headed. But what's interesting is that Smith doesn't start there. That only really comes, TMS has seven parts. It comes in part three and gets developed all through up to part six. I won't do that inside baseball. But he starts in a different place, not with objectivity, but the embodied experience of how we feel in direct situations, with feelings and sentiments, with sympathy, with the sorts of things that even in a world that doesn't praise or value objectivity, perhaps to the same extent, the sorts of things that are familiar, and are familiar especially in a culture, an identity politics culture, in which feelings, the feelings especially of self-righteousness among other things, the feelings of social justice and that comes from championing a cause, beginning with those feelings and describing them as natural feelings, some as beneficial feelings, others as dangerous feelings, and only after having introduced us to the goods and bads, as it were, of those feelings, does he then come to say, the impartial spectator is also necessary. That once we've had these experiences, we have a need to cultivate this objectivity in the form of the impartial spectator. Now, doing it that way is very different from standing over and having a first sentence that says, 
You need to be objective. I suspect that Smith wouldn't have found much of an audience, and especially wouldn't find much of an audience today if he began there. Instead, he begins with feeling beings, and then gradually explains, from there, we need to cultivate. There are certain challenges that come from being a feeling being. So he, sort of, I think, wants to make the case for why we need to become objective, given the way we're made, rather than starting with that finger wagging of saying, objectivity is better than just following your sentiments. Does that sort of make sense? So it's sort of the route that he takes. And I think it's maybe not a bad route for a culture in which we're driven by passions in our politics very frequently. So objectivity is a solution to the problem of subjectivity, in a sense, a solution to being sort of swayed in all directions. Yeah, it's, these aren't Smith's words, but I yeah. think they capture something that's very important to his project. There, there's something about his idea of happiness that is calm and quiet, right? He's, he's identified with the Stoics for this reason, maybe, but the idea that what we're looking for really is tranquility. Yes. Um, is, that, is that true? Is that persuasive to you? Um, in a certain way, yes, absolutely. Do um, students feel that that's persuasive to them? Are they looking for tranquility? <laughs> One thing we're seeing, I, 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 I hadn't thought that this would come up, but that we begin here, but I think it's certainly true. Um, one thing that we've seen, as I've now been in the business, as it were, for two decades, uh, and um, Go on to any university campus these days, uh, talk to any um, uh, dean of students, and they will tell you universally that they are seeing a remarkable spike in anxiety. Mm -hmm. And that across the board, students are coming in with diagnoses, with uh, projects for remedying, or programs for remedying, having worked with physicians and doctors, that um, in an unprecedented level that we've never seen before. Now, why is that happening? I, I, well beyond my pay scale to be able to answer that. But it is happening. <clears throat> anxiety is a real phenomenon now more than ever. Anxiety was a real phenomenon for Smith. He speaks with tremendous eloquence. I have long thought about writing a paper. I'm finally going to do this. I've, I've been thinking about it for so long. But for having written 20 papers on Smith already, I finally have to write this one. Um, uh, I, I, Smith probably had OCD. I don't think there's any way to put it other than that. He describes the experience of anxiety so profoundly, all wrapped up, repetitive thoughts going through his head all the time, and then the need to cultivate this distance from them, to cultivate a tranquility. So tranquility, I don't think, was just sort of abstract thought for him or an abstract ideal, but something that he was trying to achieve in his own life. And if it really is true that this is something that's a live issue today, especially for younger people, well, then I think he has something to offer. Mm -hmm. And finally, I have to say that I owe these insights to my mother, my mother who is a psychologist, a child psychologist, uh, with whom I've had a wonderful bonding. You mentioned my daughter to whom the book is dedicated, but in the other direction, uh, 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 she too recognized. I, I the professionals see that Smith uh, has these issues as well, so perhaps I'm not just a crazy man. Well, the other Hanley is partially responsible for this. Other questions? Please in the back. Hi, uh, Joseph Lacani with the King's College in New York City. Terrific discussion, gentlemen. Thank you so much for it. It's so illuminating. Um, Professor, you mentioned uh, that, for, that for, for Smith, wealth, status, and power are the things that he thinks uh, are so motivational to human nature. What about the pursuit of truth? Because we associate him, of course, with the Enlightenment, and we, we associate Enlightenment thinkers with this pursuit of truth. Mm -hmm. does, does, does Smith see uh, the pursuit of truth wherever he can find it, scientific truth, moral truth, relig religious truth? Does he see that as part of the virtuous life, or does that, is that not part of his discussion? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, it comes out a little bit in the wise and virtuous man, who is uh, uh, very ardently pursuing the truth of what an excellent character and the truth of absolute perfection. And that takes some serious work, observation, reflection, insight, intuition. Uh, and so I think that um, endemic to the enterprise of seeking virtue is a certain uh, disposition and desire to seek the truth. Um, Smith, though, also, uh, you mentioned also scientific truth. It should be said that where he addresses this most directly, this wonderful essay that um, only really specialists read today he wrote several essays um, on the history of the sciences, including a remarkable essay on the history of astronomy. 
And he begins that essay with the question of what is it that leads human beings to desire to know the truth? What is it that st stimulates wonder? And in part it is this longing to know the truth and a desire to find, as it happens, tranquility that comes from the um, itch of not knowing. And so uh, there's this, uh, I think, um, built into both the scientific inquirer, the moral inquirer, Smith thinks is a profound desire to know. At the same time, though, to be fair to Smith, even though we have this desire to know, Smith is, I think it should be said, somewhat skeptical. And I use that term both in the colloquial sense as well as the 18th century more technical sense. Smith is somewhat skeptical that we can have final answers. And the history of astronomy that so eloquently describes the pursuit of truth in astronomy that works from the earliest ancient systems, Tom Egg, all the way up to, uh, to, um, to Newton. Um, Newton ends up being almost an apotheosis. Newton is this great hero. But he ends the essay, Smith does, by saying, perhaps even in time we'll discover that there are other principles. So there is a certain openness that Smith recognizes from having seen this history of revolutions within the sciences. Does that make him a skeptic, skeptic towards absolute truth or objectivity? I think that that would be too easy an association to make. But there is this interesting balance that Smith has balance between the deep longing for truth that he thinks is very natural to us, as well as the humility that he thinks is also very healthy from knowing the limits of our own minds. And um, those who would uh, 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 suggest that we can have final answers, um, Smith tends to want to draw back just a bit from that. More questions? If not, then I, I can end with one final question. Um, and it relates to the answer you just gave. Smith seems to be a kind of philosopher of pluralism, or at least he takes for granted a certain kind of pluralism, both in the nature of society, but also his approach to philosophical questions is to say there are better answers and worse answers, more than to say there is an answer. Uh, is, that, is that fair? Yeah, as you were saying that, I was looking back over your shoulder, never a polite thing to do, but in, <laughs> in this particular case, it's, uh, it's apt. Because I was thinking of the discussion I had with my editor when we were coming up with the title of the book. Um, the subtitle uh, only focused on the, it's Adam Smith on Living a Better Life. And I was really invested in that because um, other candidates that have been put on the table, Adam Smith on Living the Good Life or The Best Life for a Human Being. And it seemed to me inauthentic in some deep way, even as Smith is talking about living well, to have that definite article, the. For Smith, I think, even though he describes that wise and virtuous man, there are lots of different forms that this can take. And there are lots of different virtues that are valuable in a society. And um, I, I think that, you, you, again, your word pluralism is a modern word. But I think it does capture something that's very important for Smith. And um, this idea of uh, different individuals striving to live individually better lives. That's the model, rather than trying to funnel everyone into one particular model. Well, let's thank Ryan Hanley for this book and for this conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks to all of you for joining us.